All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining BrainMap today. I want to remember it, uh, to remind you that this BrainMap seminar uh, series is co-sponsored by the P41 Funded Center for Mesoscale Mapping housed at the Martino Center. It is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, um, Dr. Evelina Fedorenko. Dr. Fedorenko received her bachelor's degree from Harvard University in 2002 and her PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2007. In 2014, she joined the faculty at Harvard Medical School and in 2019, she returned to MIT where she's currently Associate Professor of Neuroscience in the Brain and Cognitive Science Department and the McElroy Institute for Brain Research. Dr. Fedorenko uses fMRI, EEG, MEG, intracranial recordings and stimulation, as well as computational modeling to study the language system in adults and children, including those with developmental and acquired brain disorders. Dr. Fedorenko, the virtual stage is all yours. Thanks so much for having me, you guys. Um, I'm going to start with two disclaimers. One is that I think um, this talk may be a little bit more on the cognitive side um, than uh, the usual brain map seminars. It's basically a synthesis of um, several lines of work that I've been pursuing over the last decade. And of course, it's all relying on your scientific data, but I'm presenting it through this kind of um, lens of a um, big cognitive question of why we have language as a species. Um, and the second disclaimer, and I, so, so I hope it still will be um, uh, of interest. Um, and the second is that I'm a little sick and so I'm sorry if my, um, if I end up coughing or having to blow my nose or something. But uh, okay, uh, so I'll start with an acknowledgement um, that this research program has had um, numerous contributors starting from my um, mentors, um, uh, Ted Gibson and then Nancy Kamwisher, um, and many, many postdocs, graduate students and RAs over the last bunch of years. And I'm incredibly grateful to have had a chance to work with all these wonderful people. And I'm also thankful to um, MGH um, for providing me my first um, academic home as a faculty member when I um, uh, finished my postdoc at MIT. So it's good to be back in this virtual format. All right, so um, I want to start with um, a famous quote from David Marr, who argued that to understand the relationship between uh, behavior and brain, one has to begin by defining, oh, sorry, um, one has to begin by defining the function or computational goal of a complete behavior. Only then can a neuroscientist determine how the brain achieves that goal. So language, which can be broadly defined as a generative system of form meaning mappings with some constraints, um, emerged in our species quite some time ago, and when exactly is still um, hotly debated. But regardless of when language emerged, we can ask, why did it emerge? To what end? And for many components of living organisms, um, the function is kind of obvious, right? We have lungs to breathe, we have legs to walk, uh, we have eyes to see. Um, and for language, it may seem clear, um, but actually um, has been a topic of fierce debates for um, centuries. So there's two ideas that have been prominent. Um, one, uh, perhaps um, one that's kind of more intuitive, uh, at least to some of us, is that we have language to share thoughts with each other. And we can speculate on why that might be useful with ideas ranging from um, facilitating cooperative behaviors uh, to passing on uh, knowledge either about how to make better tools or socially relevant information like who to trust and so on. An alternative idea, however, is that language evolved to enable us to think more complex thoughts. And in fact, one of uh, perhaps the most famous um, uh, linguists or philosophers of language, Noam Chomsky, has long been arguing um, for decades against the communicative function of language and for um, language as enabling complex thought. So here's a quote from a presentation of his just a couple of years ago, where he said, almost all of your use of language is internal. Virtually all of the use of language has nothing to do with communication. The idea that language has evolved as a system of communication or designed for communication makes no sense. Uh, instead, like I said, he's been arguing that language evolved to enable complex thought. So he says the systems of thought use linguistic expressions for reasoning, interpretation, organizing action, and other mental acts. 
And this idea has been advocated by many others, including famously um, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who um, said the limits of language mean the limits of my world. So how, um, how would we know one way or another, right? <laughs> Why do we have language? Evolutionary questions are hard questions, um, notoriously. But a lot of the debates that has been going on for, um, you know, like I said, centuries now, um, has been based on kind of intuition and introspection, and those are just not the best scientific methods we have. So um, I'm going to argue that there's two kinds of empirical data that can in inform this question. So first, we can examine the relationship between language and other aspects of cognition, including um, most relevantly complex thought and reasoning uh, and social cognitive abilities to see whether language may be closer in some way to one or the other. And I'll clarify what I mean by closer in a few minutes. And second, we can examine different properties of language to see if they may shed light on what language, what, what the language system may be useful for. So before I um, do these things, let me just introduce to you the uh, brain network that supports language processing uh, to bring us all on the same page. Um, that's the system that I'll be mostly talking about today. So for a long time now, we've known that a set of brain regions um, in the left hemisphere in most individuals are important for um, language function. And using brain imaging approaches like um, fMRI, we can find these regions in just a few minutes of scanning by contrasting brain responses um, as individuals read or listen to sentences versus stimuli that are perceptually similar but lack uh, meaning and structure. So it could be a sequence of non-words like blicket, florp, and so on, um, or sentences in an unfamiliar language, or just speech that's acoustically degraded enough so that you can't discern um, meaning in it. Um, now, these brain regions exhibit um, a few key functional properties. Uh, so they respond during language understanding, um, spoken, written, or signed if we're um, uh, using a sign language. Um, they also respond during production, also across modalities, writing or speaking. Um, topographically and functionally similar regions emerge across diverse languages. So we have now tested this in about 50 languages across more than 10 diverse language families. And you find generally similar topography and similar uh, functional properties. Uh, the regions of this network form a functionally integrated system with strong anatomical connections and a high degree of functional synchronization and activity suggesting that these regions work together in the surface in the service of a common goal and of course we know that if parts of this network are damaged in adulthood um, we end up with linguistic deficits so some problems in comprehension production or both now, I mentioned to you that you can find this network with functional contrast, like um, between sentences and non-word sequences, but this network is also one of the intrinsic networks in the brain and that um, you can just have people um, do some naturalistic thing in the scanner, like nothing um, as in the resting state paradigm or watch a movie or listen to a story. Uh, and you can recover this network um, from just patterns of um, voxel uh, uh, time course fluctuations. And recent evidence from um, Rod Braga's work um, shows that, um, so this is just uh, three sample subjects, and there's two kinds of data sh shown there, but you may not be able to quite see it, so I'm zooming in here um, on this inset, uh, and there's two kinds of data here um, sh shown here. So in black are the outlines of this network as defined based on intrinsic bold signal fluctuations, so just the um, sets of voxels that go up and down together as people are um, engaging in naturalistic cognition. This is a uh, resting state data here. And overlaid in yellow and orange are activations for the sentences over non-words contrast, which is the contrast that my group has been using for um, over 10 years to identify these language responsive areas. And you can see that there's a very tight correspondence. And so to me, this suggests that a sent, uh, contrast like sentences versus non-words is just a quick and efficient way to pull this network out of the brain, um, which is useful if you're trying to understand what the system does and want to study it across you know, many different manipulations and so on. Another important point about this network um, is that the precise locations of language areas vary substantially across individuals. Uh, you can see that in these even three sample participants here, um, the general topography is broadly similar, but the precise location, shapes, and sizes of these regions vary substantially. And because of this variability, I have argued that um, 
it is really critical to define these regions um, within individual subjects as opposed to um, average brains together and examine um, group level maps, which leads to a lot of blurring and information loss. Um, and I've mostly argued for this approach in fMRI, but we've also shown that this approach extends naturally to intracranial recordings where you can use um, a similar contrast to select uh, subsets of electrodes that show language responsiveness. Um, however, uh, individual functional localization may not always be possible. And so we've now created this probabilistic language atlas based on um, over 800 individuals that we've scanned in my lab on the language localizer task, this robust um, contrast that uh, targets these um, language areas. Um, and using this atlas, you can now estimate for any given voxel in the MNI space or any given vertex um, in the FS average space, the probability that um, this voxel falls within the language system. And that can help interpret some past uh, group studies, um, uh, interpret lesion locations, and so on and so forth. Um, we're just about to release this now. And um, with uh, Bruce Fischel's group here at MGH, we're trying to see whether some parts of the activation landscape are actually predictable from um, the fine-grained folding patterns. The kind of standard wisdom for the last bunch of years has been that in the association cortex, you just can't use anatomy to predict functional areas, location, locations of functional areas. Um, but it seems like there's actually some anatomical landmarks that are highly predictive of where these regions um, land across people. And we're trying to understand the significance of this anatomical to functional alignment. Okay, so now onto the first kind of evidence um, relevant to the relationship between the language system and the rest of our mind and brain. So let's first consider the spectrum of abilities that humans possess, right? So we can do a lot of things in the world. Aside from our perceptual intelligence, uh, which supports our ability to recognize objects, faces, or voices, and our motor intelligence that supports our ability to physically interact with the world, um, we can do math, um, we can engage in logical reasoning, uh, we can acquire totally new evolutionary skill, evolutionarily new skills like computer coding, um, we can create and appreciate music. Um, we have a host of executive abilities like attention, working memory, inhibitory control, as well as planning and decision making. And using those abilities, we can solve totally new problems um, on unfamiliar abstract stimuli. Uh, we can interact, interact cooperatively with our conspecifics, um, jointly solve problems. We can figure out what somebody else is thinking or feeling. Um, and resolve conflicts both locally and at the large societal scale. And of course, we possess a rich knowledge of the world, right? We know about the objects and their properties about events and their typical orderings, about the physics of the world um, and what things are possible in reality versus um, just in our imagination. And so how does language relate to all of these other abilities? And this is the question that drew me to cognitive neuroscience in the first place. Um, I started out in uh, behavioral um, uh, and computational modeling work, but it, there were just no great methods available for understanding if language may share resources with some of these other abilities. So I turned to cognitive neuroscience. Um, okay, and so of greatest interest here for the purposes of um, how I've structured this talk, of course, are the relationships between, on the one hand, language and complex reasoning which includes general executive abilities um, that have been strongly linked to fluid intelligence problem solving, um, abilities like math and logical reasoning, um, and also abilities to just reason about objects and events in the world, what some people call common sense reasoning. And on the other hand, between language and social cognition um, and perception, um, which as I'll tell you soon appears to draw on resources that are um, distinct from those that um, uh, support the abilities outlined here in blue. And I'm trying to make an argument about the computational goal of language by evaluating this, these relationships with the idea that a stronger relationship um, between language and general reasoning would reinforce complex thought as a possible computational goal of language, but a stronger relationship between language and social cognition would reinforce um, the communicative function of language deeply rooted in general kind of social cooperative behaviors. Okay, so what do I mean when I say a relationship, right? So the most obvious way to examine a relationship is of course to look at overlap. Um, um, and fMRI is uh, a method that's really good for asking this kind of a question. You can say, do these two cognitive functions, mental operations draw on the same resources or not? 
and I'm schematically showing a language brain system in red here and some non-linguistic system of interest in gray, right? And so we may have no overlap or partial or even complete overlap. But even in cases of fully non-overlapping systems, there may be meaningful differences in how spatially close um, the brain, the relevant brain networks are, or how strongly functionally connected they are. So does language overlap with any non-linguistic cognitive abilities? So over the years, many have argued for overlap between language processing and almost any aspect of cognition that you can think of, uh, and even perception and motor control. I will argue, however, that language doesn't actually share resources with any of these abilities that I mentioned. Um, but I will also argue that in spite of the sharp separation between language and the rest of our cognitive arsenal, that there is a deep connection between language and social cognition and a much stronger one than that existing between language and complex reasoning. And these are just the main uh, former and current student postdoc collaborators in this work. So to probe the relationship between any two abilities, um, two primary methods are used um, in our field, functional MRI and patient investigations. So first I'll present you some evidence from um, uh, functional brain imaging. So this is um, summarizing data from the last few years. So there's 32 different experiment, um, experiments with a few hundred participants where we tested overlap between language processing and a multitude of perceptual motor and cognitive abilities. And to do this, we basically found the language responsive areas in each individual brain, as I mentioned, and then asked, are these brain areas also active when we look at other people's faces, when we're solving math problems, when we listen to music, when we think about others' mental states, and so on and so forth. And so here are the responses to um, a sentence comprehension condition in uh, dark gray and a control condition where participants um, uh, read or listen to non words like uh, blick it. Um, and everything is plotted relative to a low level baseline, so just a blank screen with no stimuli presented. Um, and the, estimate, the estimates to the language localizer conditions that I'm showing you here are done with um, uh, split half, so there's no non-independence no, um, uh, non issues. So you use some part of the data to find the region and then the other half to quantify the magnitudes of responses. And so now in different colors, I'll show you responses to different non-linguistic um, stimuli and tasks. Uh, including those um, linked to complex reasoning and those linked to social perception and cognition. And I tried to group these various conditions into categories by color. So we have um, visual, social, and non-social conditions in yellow, auditory conditions in orange, including different kinds of um, music uh, in light orange bars here, hand and face motor control in red, numerical cognition, so doing math stuff and think, uh, reading computer code in purple, executive functions like inhibitory control and working memory in blue, categorization tasks in teal, and visual event perception in green. Um, and some of these events also involve, um, uh, some of these conditions involve events that evoke mentalizing. So as you can see, these brain areas that work so hard when we're processing linguistic input work about as hard when you're solving a math problem or holding information in working memory as they do when you're looking at a blank screen. And we can draw a line from the control condition, the reading of non-words, um, to um, across these different conditions. And the only ones that elicit a response that's even reliably above this baseline are these visual meaningful events. So looking at pictures or short videos of meaningful events um, where there's no language, um, this response is still much lower than the response elicited by sentences. And as I'll tell you in a second, patients with severe language damage don't seem to have any difficulties with visual event semantics, suggesting that this response is not uh, functionally critical. Nevertheless, I think there is um, some interest, interesting relationship there and we're uh, pursuing this. It's important to note also that all of these 64 conditions elicit very robust responses in other parts of the brain. Um, so it's not like people are not doing anything when they're processing those stimuli or engaging in those behaviors. It just happens to be not the same brain regions as those that support um, language comprehension production. Okay, and we can color the conditions that tax um, social, perceptual, and cognitive processes in green, and those that tax executive functions, reasoning, um, and problem solving in blue. And you can see that it's not the case that there's some systematically stronger response to green or blue conditions. They're all kind of similarly low. Now, a complementary approach for addressing the question of whether language shares machinery with other uh, mental functions 
is to examine cognitive abilities in individuals who lack a proper, properly functioning language system uh, due to aphasia. And most informative are cases of um, what's known as global aphasia. So this is um, a disorder that results from severe damage to effectively the entire language system, typically due to a large stroke in the middle cerebral artery. I apologize for these truck noises outside. I don't know what's going on there. Um, anyway, so Rosemary Varley, a, a colleague of mine um, who is at UCL, um, has been studying this population for many years um, and um, over many, many studies, she and her colleagues have examined a wide range of non-linguistic abilities, similar to how we've done with functional MRI, and we've collaborated on some of this work with her. And it turns out, strikingly, that in spite of these severe, um, highly profound linguistic deficits, right, these individuals cannot produce anything, they can't understand sentences, they sometimes have residual single word comprehension, but very, very limited for just, you know, super high frequency words. Um, they nevertheless have, um, uh, they can do math, they can solve logic problems, do Sudoku puzzles, um, uh, play chess, uh, solve problems. Um, they have intact executive abilities. Uh, they can appreciate structure and music. They have um, uh, preserved social and emotional skills and a, and a rich understanding of how the world works. So the only thing um, these patients lack seems to be the ability to convert the thoughts into a verbal format and to extract meaningful information from others' linguistic productions. Um, and these findings, of course, align very well with the kind of selectivity that I showed you uh, based on um, fMRI studies, um, as well as with self-reports of um, aphasic individuals going back centuries. So there's, you know, people like uh, Noam Chomsky and others who have these introspective intuitions that um, complex thought relies on language, but then there are also people who have lost their linguistic ability and have very useful insights. Um, and typically these insights are in the form, so this is a quote from a German philosopher uh, in the 18th century, Johann Spalding, who um, uh, had um, a stroke that led to aphasia. And he wrote, presumably with great effort, um, I saw and recognized everything around me in its true shape. I tried to speak to see if something coherent could be uttered, but no matter how much I forced attention and thoughts together, shapeless and entirely different words ensued rather than the ones I wanted. I therefore contented myself with the expectation that I would not be able to speak or write for the duration of my life, but the principles and dispositions known by me would always remain the same. And there's many, many quotes like that that you can find from um, individuals with aphasia highlighting the fact that they can think just fine or their world, their understanding of how things are, um, are preserved. They just can't convert um, those abstract representations into linguistic forms. A couple of things that are important to keep in mind when we think about um, the separation between um, linguistic function and other um, cognitive functions. Uh, one is that uh, functional specialization in no way implies innateness. We know that specialization can and does emerge as a function of our experience with the world. So um, a re region in the um, uh, ventral visual stream uh, in the left hemisphere known as the visual word form area uh, is a prime example of such emergent specialization. Um, and the second is that the fact that, um, oh, and I should say that I think with respect to the language system, I in fact very strongly suspect that the system emerges also as we learn um, linguistic representations, um, uh, you know, early in childhood and if we need a place to store these form meaning mappings. And so we um, uh, eventually um, use this set of cortical regions to store that language knowledge. Um, and the second non-implication is that the fact that language draws on specialized machinery, um, which like I said, plausibly stores our language knowledge, uh, does not mean that the computations that support language are fundamentally distinct from those that support information processing in other domains. In fact, I suspect that uh, many, if not all of the computations that have been uh, invoked across domains like retrieving representations from memory, predictive processing, integrating elements into more complex representations are the very same ones that support language processing. And, um, but importantly, we do have ample evidence that such computations appear to be implemented focally within the language network, as opposed to in some centralized hubs that different domains draw on. And we have um, a summary of this evidence um, in a paper that I'm happy to share, a draft up which is under review still. Um, 
and presumably this local implementations of the computations is driven by um, computational and metabolic efficiency uh, factors um, that you get when you um, have focal things. Okay. Um, and third, um, so I've talked so far about the separation between language and thought in um, adult fully formed brains, but what about kids, right? Could language maybe be critical for the development of some aspects of complex thought? And the answer is maybe, but in a very limited way. So the strongest evidence we have here to inform this question comes from deaf kids who are born to hearing parents, which is the vast majority of deaf kids. Um, and of course, if um, the parents were not deaf, they usually are, they don't know sign language. And so in some of these cases, the kids um, don't get exposure to sign language until quite late in life. And so they may have sometimes quite extended periods where they're just not getting linguistic input. They're loved and cared for. There, there's no um, um, shortage of um, uh, care or, you know, like any other child would receive, they're just not getting linguistic input. And in some of these cases, um, linguistic input can be absent uh, through late teenage years. Um, uh, and strikingly, it seems that most reasoning abilities appear to develop just fine, absent language. Um, these kids can learn to do math, um, to play chess, do all sorts of things. And it seems that um, the only exception is some aspects of theory of mind reasoning. So thinking about other people's thoughts and I'll come back to that point in a few slides. Okay, so back to this diagram of different dimensions of internetwork intersystem relationships. So I showed you that with respect to overlap, language does not appear to overlap either with um, social perception and cognitive functions or with complex thought and reasoning. So now I'll try to convince you that there's actually a stronger connection between um, language and social cognition based on the proximity and connectivity between these um, networks, uh, along with some additional bits of evidence. So we have focused so far on the language network um, and established its separability from a host of um, uh, other systems uh, that support non-linguistic abilities. So let me now explicitly introduce two networks that support general reasoning on the one hand and social cognition on the other hand. So general reasoning appears to draw on a bilateral network of frontal and parietal areas. This network is highly domain general and is active during any cognitively effortful task, um, including kind of standard executive function tasks like working memory and cognitive control type tasks, um, problem solving tasks like standard um, IQ type puzzles, um, and abilities like math, um, logical reasoning, and computer code processing also appear to load on this network. Most importantly, this network is strongly and causally linked with fluid intelligence so that um, progressively more damage to these areas leads to uh, uh, larger losses in um, IQ. Now, social cognition, including um, theory of mind or mentalizing, draws on a right lateralized network of frontal and temporal areas. This network responds to um, tasks that basically require reasoning, thinking and reasoning about other people in both verbal and pictorial materials, uh, in both controlled and naturalistic paradigms. And a subset of this network appears to be specialized for thinking about others' thoughts in particular. Okay, so here's why I think the language network and the social cognitive network are deeply interlinked. So first, in spite of their different prominences in the left versus right hemisphere, the topographic patterns for the two networks are broadly similar, especially in the temporal cortex. Now, again, remember that within individual participants, these networks are fully dissociable. So here data from three simple subjects, um, and you can see the red uh, bits, um, the language network and the green bits, the social network are distinct, but they're also right next to each other. And the fact that they show this interdigitated pattern within broadly similar parts of the association cortex um, seems important. There is more. Uh, so not only do language and theory of mind areas uh, lay side by side in the temporal lobe, but many other functions relevant to perceiving, understanding, and interacting with conspecifics activate areas on the left lateral temporal surface from uh, face and body perception to voice recognition to biological motion perception to perceiving um, other social interactions. 
these different functions have typically been studied by distinct subfields of cognitive science and neuroscience. And I think this fractionation across fields may have obscured some important generalizations about the organization of the human social brain. And finally, in the first ever fMRI study of social processing in macaques, observing socially relevant signals was shown to recruit um, a network of brain areas whose topography is strikingly similar to the language network um, in humans. And similar results were recently reported for marmosets as well. And to me, this points to deep evolutionary links between language and social cognition. So perhaps evolutionarily, we started out with a broad swath of cortex that is receptive to all sorts of socially relevant information. And then as our brains became more complex um, and the association cortex expanded, uh, the cortex fractionated into myriad distinct areas and networks, each specialized for processing different kinds of visual, auditorial, conceptual information um, relevant to interaction with others, including a large chunk of cortex that now stores the vast number of linguistic communicative signals that is our language knowledge. And Randy Buckner here at MGH and at Harvard has been doing important com comparative work um, uh, and uh, theorizing about the evolutionary emergence of these high level association networks. Um, and if this process is recapitulated in human development, we should be able to test this. And I'm hoping that um, we can do this in the near future. Now, the second point I wanna make here is that in spite of their separability, the language and the social system show a non-trivial amount of functional synchronization during naturalistic cognition. So to test this, um, uh, we define, we can define three sets of regions, right? The language regions, the theory of mind regions, and this uh, multiple demand executive regions in each individual and extract a time course from each individually defined region as participants um, engage in rest, resting state, whatever uh, mind wandering happens uh, then, or listening to stories or watching movies. Um, and then we can compute correlations among the regions within each network, um, but also among the pairs of regions that straddle network boundaries, right? So between a language region and a social region, or between a language region and the multiple demand region. Um, and replicating others' work, we find that within network correlations are all strong for each for uh, each of the three networks. Um, the language and the multiple demand network, um, the bar in purple show effectively zero um, synchronization, but then there's this non-trivial amount of um, synchronization that consistently comes about when you look at the relationship at um, co-fluctuations in, in the language and the um, theory of mind network. And I should say that this difference is not driven by just the um, higher proximity between the language and the theory of mind network, uh, you can find this even when you compare a language and a multiple demand region next door compared to a language and a theory of mind region that are quite far from each other. And this difference suggests that the language and the theory of mind networks may work together to a stronger extent than the language and the multiple demand network. And a few other reasons for a link between language and social cognition are worth mentioning, including um, the long observed dominance of naturalistic uh, linguistic exchanges by social information, um, we tend to talk about other people. Um, the fact that mentalizing appears to be a critical component of understanding others' utterances and conversing in socially appropriate ways. Um, the fact that some early developing social abilities like the ability for joint attention appear to be critically important for language learning. And as I mentioned earlier, the fact that language appears to maybe be uh, critical for developing some of the more sophisticated aspects of theory of mind reasoning. All right, so now um, I'm gonna shift gears to look more deeply within the language system to see if some of its properties um, of the linguistic representations and computations may give us some hints as to the function of language, as to what language is good for. And I will argue that language has both some properties that suggest that it is well-suited for communication, uh, efficient communication, uh, and some other properties that actually make it not suitable for carrying out complex thought. Okay, so there are at least um, two features of language that make it likely that communication was the driving function, the primary function of the system. So one is that natural language, and there's uh, abundant already and still growing literature supporting this, natural languages appear to be highly efficient for information transfer. 
There's evidence from properties of the sound systems to lexicons to grammars um, showing that linguistic code is both short on average, making it easy to produce, and it's um, contextually disambiguated and highly redundant, making it easy to understand and robust to um, noise, robust to, robust to some signal loss. And if language evolved for internal thought, it is unclear why it would exhibit such characteristics. And a lot of this work is summarized in this recent um, review paper by uh, Gibson and colleagues. And second, um, language processing uh, relies on predictive coding. And prediction in language, of course, I think, of course, only makes sense um, from the perspective of a comprehender who is trying to infer the intended meaning from a linguistic signal and engaging in prediction facilitates this process by basically reducing the effort that you have to um, put in to process the highly expected elements that you have pre-activated. And again, it's not clear how and why our language processing mechanisms would have become predictive if language was primarily an internal system of thought. Um, in terms of um, evidence for predictive processing in language, there's quite a lot. Um, I'm gonna actually skip this little bit here just in the interest of time and tell you from um, a powerful recent, relatively recent source of evidence for the role of prediction in language, which comes from artificial neural networks of um, uh, language, artificial neural network models of um, language. So there have generally been two kind of long-standing barriers to going beyond verbal descriptive hypotheses about language mechanisms, about the actual algorithms that help us produce and understand language. One is that um, the only model organism we have available to us is humans, and there are limited ways in which we can mess with human brains and probe them. And the other is that we have lacked um, adequate computationally explicit accounts of how meaning can be extracted from language. But just a few years ago, to a great surprise, I mean, I would not have predicted this back in graduate school, the second constraint has been effectively lifted uh, with increases in computing power, availability of large linguistic corpora and machine learning advances leading to real engineering breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, including in language, where suddenly artificial neural network models of language, um, especially what's known as the transformer architectures, like you may have heard of GPT-2, even if you're not working in this area, um, being able to answer questions, generate free form text, um, translate between languages and so on. Now, these models have received and continue to receive criticism uh, from a few different directions, but most of these criticisms are, um, and the criticisms are along the lines that these models don't really understand language, uh, but most of the criticisms um, are misguided because they basically conflate language and thought, which as I've argued to you should not be conflated. And the kinds of uh, criticisms um, that people make are in the form of, oh look, this model that supposedly understand language can solve uh, a math problem. Like if I say, you know, if I add 21 and 34, the answer will be, and they can't do that very well. They produce a number, but it's not gonna be the correct number. Now I showed you the human language system doesn't do this. So why would you expect a system that's not trained to think, that's trained to basically do language, uh, keep track of, um, pay attention to the statistical co-occurrence patterns of um, words and constructions and so on. Why would you expect it to generalize to these abstract thinking abilities? Anyway, um, but um, uh, back to um, my point, the fact that training all these highly successful models, um, all, these, all these successful models are trained on uh, basically prediction tasks uh, can be taken to suggest that this form of training leads to flexible and robust linguistic representations, presumably because trying to predict the next word encourages the network to build uh, a joint probability model of the linguistic signal, if you wish, where um, you implicitly need sensitivity to diverse kinds of regularities like the syntactic structure, the particular words, um, and so on, and plausibility, and so on. Um, and in recent work, we attempted to explicitly link the representations extracted from these models to representations obtained during uh, human language processing um, in, the, in, the, in, in the brain. Uh, a graduate student, Martin Schrumpf, um, led this effort, and he adopted this approach that proved highly successful in the domain of vision. Um, which um, is known as integrative benchmarking. And the es essence of the approach is that in order to link uh, computation and brain function, um, it's not going to be enough to test a single model and a single data set. 
Of course, no single model is probably the right model, uh, but we can learn a lot by looking for consistent patterns of performance across many different models um, applied to multiple data sets together with considering performance of these models on the proposed core computational function of the brain system in question, um, like object recognition in um, vision or say an expert prediction in language. So what we did was examine 43 state-of-the-art language models against three human uh, neural data sets by basically feeding the same stimuli to models for which we had data from the human brain, uh, fitting a regression between the models and the human neural representations, and then seeing how the model with the fixed um, weights generalizes to an unseen portion of the data. So first, I did not think that this would work as well as it did. So first, this is how well do these models perform, right? If we're only capturing some insignificant fraction of the variance, maybe it's, you know, we're not there yet or something. But um, it turns out that um, uh, some of the models already do really well. So I'm plotting here normalized predictivity. Um, each bar here is a model, one of those 43 models. And the ceiling is based on the internal reliability of the data set, so how well you can predict um, one participant's neural responses from the average of the other participants or from you know individual other participants. And there are two things to note here. So one is that models vary quite a lot in their performance. Um, and um, some models in the class of these unidirectional um, uh, attention transformers, the rightmost set of bars, basically already get to the estimated ceiling level. Yeah, I already said that. Okay, um, but critically, uh, we then asked whether um, the models that perform best on the next word prediction are also the same ones that provide a better fit to human neural data. And the answer is yes. So now I'm showing you um, this plot where now each dot is a model. On the x-axis is prediction of the model on the next word, um, on the, uh, performance of the model on the next word prediction task and lower numbers here on the right are um, uh, better performance, lower perplexity. And on the y-axis is how well the model captures human neural data. And you find this very strong relationship. You may ask, is it just because models that do best on next word prediction are bigger models? They have more units or more layers. That's not the case. You can take um, decontextualized embedding of the same dimensionality and that does not capture human neural data um, well at all. And then we also asked whether there's something special about this next word prediction or whether model performance on any language task would produce a similar kind of a positive relationship. And so we took a bunch of tasks from a standard natural language processing um, set of benchmarks known as the GLUE benchmarks, which include things like deciding whether a sentence is well formed or not, um, how similar to sentences are in meaning and so on. Uh, and you find no relationship. This is now average performance on those other tasks and uh, brain predictivity. And here, bar showing predictivity for next word prediction in blue and these other sophisticated language tasks in um, different shades of gray. So it appears that optimizing for predictive representations may be a critical objective for both biological and in silico um, language networks. Um, how much time do I have? Sorry, I'm, um, my timer is being... Um... Okay, it's the one fifteen. Okay, and you guys go, how much time should I leave? leave how, like, how much should I go for? Uh, I'm trying to figure out if I should shorten a little bit in the end. Um, it's okay, I shouldn't worry. I should just finish okay. the talk. Okay. It's okay, I'll go for a few more minutes then. Um, so now I want to mention briefly two properties of language that make it actually not well suited for or even compatible with supporting complex thought. So one is um, the following. So complex thought typically involves relating different propositions to one another. So naturally requires integration of information across quite extended temporal contexts. Yet the language system appears to have a relatively short temporal receptive window. This notion of temporal receptive windows is growing in popularity in neuroscience. Um, a lot of important work has been, by, has been done by Uri Hassan at Princeton. Um, and it's basically a temporal analog of spatial receptive fields um, in the visual cortex, where the size of the spatial field increases as you move from primary to higher level um, visual areas. And so the temporal receptive window of a cell or a brain area is how much of the preceding context affects the processing of the current stimulus. And as with spatial receptive fields, it seems that the size of the temporal receptive windows increases from primary auditory areas to higher level areas. Um, 
but the Templar Septuagint or the language regions is still short. So we've long known that the language system um, that I've been talking about is not sensitive to structure the discourse level. The system responds just as strongly to a set of totally unconnected random sentences as it does to a you know, beautiful connected story discourse, right? Um, and um, other evidence, so that already suggests that it's probably somewhere between a single word and a sentence. Um, and recent um, work from a few uh, strands of uh, growing evidence suggests that the language system's temporal receptive window is, a, is actually only about um, six words, which is um, incredibly short if you think about it. Words is probably not the right um, unit, it's probably bits, but word is just a useful kind of operationalization to, um, um, to, to use for thinking about this. Now, the fact that these, th this window is so short fits well with evidence that um, now comes from many, many languages that um, natural languages actually minimize dependencies between words. So even though we can process sentences that have very non-local connections among words, most um, linguistic input that our system gets has dependencies um, within very short um, uh, windows. And the length of the span may be related to something like the average length of clauses, which in turn may correspond to events in the world, which is kind of a core unit of our um, experience. Now, of course, we have mechanisms in our brains that keep track of information over longer time scales. Um, in fact, one system I haven't talked about today known as the default network appears to have long um, integration windows for both stories and nonverbal stimuli like movies. Um, this network for many years was confused with the theory of mind network that I did talk about, but recent work by Rod Braga, Randy Buckner, and Lauren De Nicola uh, um, established that um, using robust individual subject analysis that these are completely spatially and functionally segregated networks, although they're next door to each other. And so this default network may be linked, well, it, it has been linked to episodic projection, so projecting yourself into the past or the future, and given its long temporal receptive window, it may be the system that constructs what's known as situation models as we process um, uh, input, including uh, linguistic input. And I think um, that's a system where some of the complex thinking is um, going on. But the fact that the language system doesn't even go beyond like a single clause tells you that it can't possibly support complex reasoning. Okay, and then one other point um, I wanna make here, um, and I'm just, thinking about how to best do this. Is it so, okay, I guess I can say briefly, I mean, I don't worry about this, the details of this figure, but the whole uh, premise of this uh, story where um, uh, language enabled complex thought relies on the idea that linguistic, synt linguistic syntax, so the set of rules that enables us to combine words together is highly abstract um, in, uh, recent theorizing within that framework, it's been reduced to a single operation that basically combines two elements of the right kind into a more complex representations. And the key thing about um, the, that framework is that the, the, um, this operation does, largely doesn't care about the content of what it's combining, right? It's just this you know, pure kind of combinatorial operation. So maybe it evolved in the context of language, right? The idea. Um, and then the idea to put things into these complex representations in an abstract way enabled more complex um, thought, uh, but um, uh, linguistic syntax is not abstract. Um, and again, there's, you know, that has been debated for many, um, many years, but there's now a lot of evidence, including from uh, neural data. So there is no um, focal brain region that just does um, syntax and nothing else. It seems to be a distributed process across the entire language network and critically, every bit of the language network that cares about structure in the linguistic signal is just as sensitive to meanings of individual words. So we'll respond more to a real word like table compared to a non-word like blicket, suggesting that the regions that store um, words um, are the very same regions that combine these words into more complex representations. Um, and this kind of strong integration between word meanings and linguistic structure building um, is very much along the general, um, kind of fits with this general recent questioning of the distinction between memory and computation in the brain. Um, and for memory being kind of a core participant in neural computation. And if you're interested in this general topic, there are these two, um, one very recent one a few years ago, 
papers uh, both published in ticks, um, which kind of goes through some arguments from both neurobiology, where we don't have separate neurons to process information and to store information, and also from what we know about efficient computation in general from theoretical computer science, where um, memory basically allows for reuse of past computations through memorization, where the results of function calls are stored and so can be called upon when um, the same input occurs again uh, in the future. Okay, and so go, to go back to the property of language um, uh, under discussion, if language doesn't rely on abstract combinatorial operation, if it's all tight, very tight to uh, meanings of particular words, um, combined with the fact that it also does not respond when we engage in complex thought in other domains, like I mentioned, it just seems um, not right that language could have given rise to complex thought and reasoning. Um, and so to go back to this question I posed at the beginning of the talk, um, whether the primary function of language is to think complex thoughts or to share thoughts with others. Um, uh, I've shown you that the language system is highly segregated from the rest of the brain and strongly specialized for linguistic processing, at least in the adult brain. Uh, but um, uh, I think there's this deep connection between the language system and the system that supports social cognition, a deeper one that the, than the one that exists between language and complex reasoning. And further, some properties of language make it well suited for communication, and other properties make it ill suited for complex thought. And I think together, um, um, this body of evidence support um, the communicative function of language um, and suggest the idea that language evolved to allow for more complexity in thought um, is unlikely. So, just to um, mention a couple of um, uh, ways in which this program is. Um, evolving further. So I think um, what I'm perhaps most excited about is um, developing computationally explicit models of both language and thought. And here there's kind of two, um, three, three prongs uh, to this approach. So one is um, we're pushing on the data collection front because although there's tons and tons of data sets available, most of them don't have this property um, where you have reliable estimates to particular sentences or particular phrases. And so we're focusing here on intracranial approaches, including single cell recordings, although we're complementing them, of course, with fMRI and MAG. Um, but we're also using um, uh, machine learning algorithms to optimize stimulus selection so that we can best discriminate among different models and model classes. Um, we're starting to dissect these high performing models to try to understand whether it's some aspects of their architecture or training regimen or the computational objective function um, that contributes um, to good fit to human neural um, data during language processing. And so the goal here, of course, is to basically understand the necessary and sufficient conditions for a model um, such that it captures human neural data well. Um, this is building very um, strongly on the foundation laid in um, the vision domain of this kind of an approach. And then uh, people like Josh Denenbaum and many others, of course, um, um, have long been building models actually of thought. So these are models that typically include some symbolic or sub-symbolic representations. And even though, like I said, in the human mind and brain, thought and language are um, entirely separate, of course, they also have to connect in some way. They're implemented in separate circuits, but of course they have to um, interact. And so we're starting to try to build integrated models that include both a language component and some um, um, models that aspect different uh, components of our world knowledge um, to try to see how reasoning and language processing may uh, work together uh, in computational precise ways. Uh, another big direction is just trying to better characterize this relationship between linguistic and social mechanisms. Um, and there's a few kind of directions there. I am happy to elaborate. Um, and then the third one that remains <laughs> like a big, big puzzle in the field is the nature of uh, conceptual representations. People still don't agree on the very basic things, like whether there is symbolic representation, so whether it's all connectionist like, um, whether there's hubs in the brain that store abstract knowledge or whether different kinds of concepts are stored uh, in different parts of the brain and whether sensory and motor cortices uh, play any role and so on and so forth. So I think uh, we'll continue to push on this front um, as well. And, um, you know, a general kind of concluding point I like to make in talks these days is that um, there has been a lot of language elitism for many, many years saying language is so different from everything else. And it just can't be right. There's biological continuity. And so um, I and of course many others over the years have been making a push for learning from other species, 
um, learning from other domains where the computations I suspect are effectively the same ones. Um, and more recently learning from um, uh, machines taking advantage of these um, models to actually get to um, algorithmic like understanding of um, language processing. I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to talk. Thank you very much, um, Evelina, for the great talk. So I want um, I want to invite people to um, ask questions. They can address it to uh, using the Q and A box, or they can just raise their hand. Um, and while maybe while this someone is raising, maybe or can help me figure out who's raising the hand. But um, meanwhile, I might have I have um a general sort of like not very technical but uh, philosophical question. Um, so there is um there is a big school of thought that um, um, that supports the idea that language um, kind of like evolved suddenly uh, in a sort of like against Darwin uh, idea that um, sort of didn't really evolve for any specific function at all. And one of the main arguments for um, this theory is that um, there's never actually been any proto language. So there's never been any sort of like simple language, but language has always been this complex um, thing. And so I feel like this goes against the idea that it's not meant for complex uh, thinking. So that would be, yeah, I would love to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, um, there's, there's very little, um, there's very little in biology that um, emerges suddenly. <laughs> and um, the fact that the, the arguments that there's never been a proto-language, um, there's actually a lot of evidence that there are, there is a continuum of communication systems that we can see even in our lifetime. So the, the really exciting body of work looks at emergent sign languages. So um, I mentioned that oftentimes um, deaf kids are born to hearing parents. And so they often um, don't have a chance to interact with other users of sign languages. And in a few communities around the world, there's now three such communities that have been studied. Uh, at some point, individuals are put together and then they basically develop a full-blown language. But it takes time, it's not sudden, and there's all these different stages that you can trace through how that system kind of um, gets from some form of whatever you you know you don't want to call it proto language you know fine but it's definitely initially has um some features that um, um are um not quite the same as in many other languages um and so and actually there's um more and more evidence that some early forms of language were present as early as kind of homo erectus times which is much earlier than previously thought. Um, some of that evidence is from you know, archeological um, records. Uh, Dan Everett is um, famously currently arguing for that position, has written a lot about it. But um, you know, I, like, in general, I just think unless there is really, really robust evidence for discontinuities, we should assume continuity in biology. Um, but the evidence has to be exquisitely strong um, to argue against it. So that's just my prior biases but all right thank you uh, okay we have a question from bruce uh yeah very very nice talk um very clearly uh, laid out your premises and i think you supported uh you know your your uh, position uh extremely well so I, I just had a few uh interesting thoughts you know they're kind of uh ancillary uh, you know, anyone, for instance, who has uh, watched uh, beluga whales in action and, and interacting with both their caretakers and other beluga whales can't possibly believe that the primary uh, origins of language had to do with communication, especially in um, pelagic species where you need to communicate over long distances. And those are uh, animals that have developed these very complex languages and songs. So I think that um, if you actually, I, I'm sure there are ways to go about looking um, at a simpler uh, species with, uh, you know, kind of rudimentary to even sophisticated language capabilities to kind of address the idea of whether it's for communication or thought. So I was wondering your, your thoughts on that. And then if I can ask a second question, which is completely unrelated, you know, anyone who's done like math or music knows that you don't use language for those types of uh, things. You know, if you're playing with somebody else in a music piece, you're just thinking about the music. It's not, you're not translating it into your language. 
But I, what I was curious about is when you mentioned, um, especially that German philosopher who had the stroke, how do they translate those thoughts without language is what I kind of am wondering about. Have you thought about that? Like how, how do you actually get to the ability to extract meanings, especially for somebody like a philosopher without um, language? I don't know. I mean, so that's a, that's a very, like the, the second question, um, um, you probably have a little, little more to say about. Um, so, so thoughts seem to be abstract. They seem to not um, be verbal. And the, 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 there's a very interesting, so it's interesting that you mentioned like mathematicians and musicians, but in general, it seems that people have very strong intuitions about whether or not they use language to think. And um, we recently, well, we and a few other groups actually in parallel kind of um, discovered that people disagree hugely about this. And so some people um, don't have um, this running voice. Like, so oftentimes people say, don't you have this voice that kind of you talk, talks to yourself? And like, you know, I know people like in my family, my husband, who when he first, like when we started talking about this, he's like, I assume people just use this as a metaphor. You don't actually have like verbal things like floating in your head. Um, <laughs> like, yes, I do. And so, 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 so I think in some people, um, whatever abstract representation, whatever format we have thoughts in just percolates down into the verbal uh, format. And I don't know why that happens. I don't know if there's utility to this. And for some people, it just doesn't happen. Like there is um, kind of the flip side of um, uh, studying thought processes in, 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 in some people's inability to visualize, right? So it seems like similarly, some other people don't seem to um, kind of verbalize unless they're gonna like explicitly say it um, um, out loud. But the nature of the thought representations, I mean, I assume there's, like I said, like um, in um, the computational models that have been able to capture aspects of thought, it seems like you need at least some sub-symbolic um, and some, in some cases, symbolic representation. So it's presumably something very abstract. Um, and so, so I think the reason that language came about is we got smarter and then we had stuff to share with each other, right? Like maybe to make better tools, maybe to talk about um, other members of our groups um, as groups got larger. Um, but the nature of thought, yeah, I, I, you know, I think there's a lot to figure out there still. Um, and in terms of other animals, um, for sure, yeah. I mean, I, um, there is a big recent effort at um, MIT with uh, marmosets who are a highly social species. And um, I hope some insights will come from that. But there's, there's already a huge body of literature, of course, showing um, highly socially embedded um, uses of um, um, communicative signals. Um, and I, you know, and I think one thing that changed between um, other animals and us is that um, we simply expanded the storage capacity. And I think some of the combinatoriality may have emerged um, spontaneously once you had enough communicative signals in your store. We have like a math paper with um, Steve Piantadosi just kind of doing back of the envelope calculations and how that may have happened if that's um, of interest. But I think it's certainly not something like some fundamental new computation emerged in the human brain that allowed for language and other combinatorial stuff that just doesn't seem plausible at all. And also it's interesting that uh, people who are bad at math, uh, I've always thought that, that one of the reasons they might be bad is that they try to translate it into language. And you can see evidence in fMRI studies when people who are bad at math have started using a lot of the left hemisphere they use a lot more of their brain than people who are good at math. That's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like not efficient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very gratifying right. to see Noam yeah. Chomsky as well. <laughs> yeah, he's we have both saying the same things. We were just in a World of Science Festival event that will air sometime in June, and he still says the same exact things. Like he has not changed his mind about anything, as far as I can tell. Just, you know, one way to be. <laughs> All right, we have another question from Odid. Uh, hi, um, thank you for the fascinating talk. You covered so many important issues there. Uh, and I would like to touch upon one narrow aspect related to the computation and the, you know, the temporary receptive field that you talked about. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, you focused on the decoding aspect of computation within the six-word length, so to speak, and we look 
at the role of oscillations, you know, in the speech perception. And what we find, if you look from this viewpoint, six words correlate with the delta range. And we recently showed that the delta, a delta oscillator, acoustic driven, mm -hmm. puts together a window, um, you know, that guides computation in the phrasal level. That's very interesting. I would be very interested to read that. That sounds fascinating. Okay, but thank you for the lovely talk. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the pointer. All right. Um, so, oh, wait, no. so there's another question from Maria. Maria, do you want to mute? Hi. Um, hi, Ev. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Yeah, so um, this is a fabulous talk. So thanks very much for that. Uh, the question I had was um, you know, it's really interesting uh, how one might think about what you have to say in the context of verbal versus nonverbal IQ. You know, when you do problem solving. Uh, to what extent um, do you use language to mediate problem solving in for performance IQ tests? Um, to, because the, the way one thinks about complexity and reasoning and shapes and stuff like that, uh, do you have thoughts about that? I mean, it seems that you don't like, uh, you know, a lot of these problem solving tests, we've looked at them and um, Rosemary Varley has looked at them with patients. Um, as long as you can get the instructions across for what to do, it seems like you don't need language to solve them. Um, now, I mean, it may be that in some cases language could be helpful, but it's certainly not a critical, critically necessary um, uh, tool for solving this. Um, now, I mean, I think there's some, um, some um, issues with some of these tasks that are these, you know, artificially constructed tasks that kind of make you, um, uh, use verb like a lot of the verbal IQ tasks rely on um, you know just having a rich vocabulary or something like that so it's like it's a weird like I don't know what that construct is I mean it's not quite um, uh, linguistic knowledge it's trying to it's kind of turning language into problem solving and then once you know when you do that then you again load on this domain general multiple demand executive system not the language system um, so it seems that the language system really only comes online when the goal is to extract meaning from the signal or to generate uh, meaningful linguistic utterances based on your internal um, thoughts and goals. So, so you don't think that when the demand increases cognitively um, on a, in a, in a, even in a nonverbal IQ kind of task that you're being forced to draw on more sophisticated abilities rather than just you know, um, or rather draw on language to be able to resolve some of those relationships? I mean, empirically, it doesn't seem like you are. It seems like you keep drawing on that multiple demand system. That system is a very sophisticated system. That's what makes us smart. That system was allows us to solve novel problems. I mean, one way my former postdoc, Dan Blank, who is now a faculty at UCLA, used to talk about this, the multiple demand system as a system that evolution gave us for anything that might come along the way for which we don't have dedicated machinery. So that system is a very sophisticated and very important system. I wouldn't like rank it as lower than language, certainly by, by any means. So yeah, and it's right. like that's, yeah. Right, so, okay. So it's, so when you think of Vygotsky and you think of the whole approach of the inner voice that you were referring to and, and how do kids develop language? I was just curious because when we study development we do see some kind of fractionation in these different abilities that don't quite boil down to a very simple um, answer. Uh, and it seems like they might have deficits at, um, that show the, that the absence of language impacts their ability to solve um, more complex non-linguistic puzzles. 
Yeah. I mean, I think the devil is in the details of the evidence. Um, like, I think there's also a lot of evidence, like the, the evidence I mentioned from deaf kids growing mm. up with no linguistic input, who seem mm. to solve very sophisticated reasoning problems. Mm. Um, mm. Like I said, the only deficits that people have reliably reported are deficits in um, kind of the most sophisticated mentalizing um, issues. So thinking what somebody else thinks about something. Um, so right. that's the only place where you might see effects of language limiting thought capabilities. And every everywhere else you look, it seems like um, they can develop all of those other abilities just fine. When probed in the right way, you can tap them. Yeah, you're right. It's the devil is in the details. It's like what kind of task and what you're actually great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to read one last question from um, an anonymous attendee. So thank you for the nice talk. Um, to test language communication with machine learning models, it seems necessary to check that it has been understood on the other side. Could you comment on this uh, a bit more? Yeah, I mean, that's um, that's related to this um, question about uh, what do these models actually understand language? And I think it really depends on what you mean by understand. Like it certainly seems that they extract um, they form representations that are generally very useful to engage in text generation, and machine translation. So there are some useful representations there. Um, you may uh, approach it in the way that the question was phrased, right? Like you want to uh, have some insight into what the model um, understands, but you can also think about it like by looking at how similar those representations are to human representations that we can get from behavioral and neural methods. Like that's um, what tells you <laughs> a little bit about, you know, the level at which the model understands things. And, and I think what we've seen so far, we as a, a community, is that these models are exquisitely good at doing language and are uh, pretty abysmal at doing any kind of common sense reasoning or um, any kind of anything that requires um, thought that, um, basically extends beyond patterns of linguistic co-occurrences. But they capture aspects of language that, like I said, I would not have predicted. Like back in grad school, um, when I was interested in modeling, I looked at the connectionist models at the time, and they were just so limited in what they could do. And I was like, ah, that's just not a promising avenue. And then, you know, 10, 15 years later, we have these models that are incredibly powerful and do a lot of things that I, you know, many people would not have predicted would happen in our lifetimes. And so I think they're a very worthwhile uh, formal tool for trying to understand um, what it is that um, uh, humans do and, and also like, you know, what properties does a model need to have to capture what we see in um, human brains. Um, and also probably very exciting in terms of application to language coding. Yeah, that yeah. seems very Indeed. exciting avenue. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you again very much for joining us today um, and also everybody else for attending BrainMob. And I'll see you hopefully everyone soon in person. Um, yeah, thanks for right. Stay safe, Manuel. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. See you virtually. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> bye, bye.